I finally wrapped on a few documentary interview shoots that I was doing, and this was my rig setup, but it was only single camera. Here is uh, the director slash producer monitor that I gave uh, the client that hired me to shoot all this stuff. And this is the camera that I was operating. I was also doing audio and uh, lighting. And these were not run and gun interviews, but I had very little time to set up. So what I did was I had these two already assembled, basically already assembled some of the packages I had in other cases. And I'll show you, I'm gonna break down the camera in, in this video. And in another video, I'll break down the director's, producer's monitor. Uh, but what I had to do was, since we're moving so fast, there are a few components that are quickly detachable. And what I did was put both of these using a, a towel and t-shirts that I wrapped them in. I just put them in a large plastic storage bin and that's how I was ready to roll to each location that I was shooting at. So let me move this director's monitor out of the way, which I will review in another video. And this video will focus on the components of my camera rig. I did a breakdown of this rig in another video, but this it wasn't as complete as this rig is. And it wasn't the, I, had to, I added some things since that last video. And this is the BGH-1, Panasonic BGH-1. This is the, the 10 to 25 Lumex lens. This, this is the expensive one. That one's about $1,500. It's one of the more expensive lenses that Panasonic makes. Um, I could have used a speed booster and an adapter, but uh, the autofocus, this is better for autofocus, even though I didn't use autofocus for the interviews. Here's one side. Because uh, I we had to shoot really fast, there's a wireless system and that's also on the director's monitor. Up here is a monitor that uh, you need for a BGH-1 because if you don't have the BGH-1, it doesn't come with any kind of monitor. So you need a monitor just for the operate the camera and the menu settings. And on this side, handle, even though I, I had it on a tripod the entire time, battery system, wireless. This right here um, is the Zoom H5 that I didn't end up using for the shoots because I we, we were so pressed with time on my, on the these interviews I had to do that I had no time to use an XLR boom mic. Usually I like to boom my interviews, but because I didn't even have time to set up the boom in addition to the other the other stuff, I just lav mic the talent and we just continued and it was fine. So let me break down and as I break down this rig, I'll disassemble each piece and I'll talk a little bit about it as quickly as possible. And then I'll list all of the items, or at least the items that uh, I, I can find that are still available uh, uh, with some links below. So if you want something like this, or if I'm showing off some things that look cool for you that you could use, maybe you could uh, adapt them. The, these pieces aren't that expensive. The lens and the body here, I would say they're fairly expensive, but compared to a lot of other documentary rigs that if you're shooting professionally, like the Canon C70, for example, that's $550, uh, so $5,500 uh, without the lens. I was shooting in Los Angeles, these interviews, and the documentary shoots that I was on, I was interviewing uh, filmmakers, film, film directors and actors and writers and stuff, and they were impressed with this camera. <laughs> that was one of the big selling points of of packaging something like this. And I know a lot of people say this and it seems kind of funny that having a bigger, fancier looking camera adds value to uh, the, the, the shoot. And it, you know, that psychology, it, it's true. Especially when you're working with people who are familiar with camera stuff. Like if you're maybe interviewing people out in the Midwest or just someplace really far away from that they're not used to being on camera or seeing cameras, this actually might be too intimidating. So that might not make the, the subject comfortable. But when you're interviewing people who are familiar with tech or with filmmaking and, and, and video and news and journalism and all that stuff, they see a camera like this and uh, they might not know exactly how much every component costs, but you see something like this and they immediately respect the the shoot that you're on because it looks like you're showing up with a lot of money. So let me break this down. So on, on the top here uh, that I'm framing out, I have a OC monitor and this you need in order to view anything on the camera. So this is just 
uh, it's not touch screen. You just plug it on here. This is fine. This was cheap. This was about $125. I don't think it's amazing, but for $125, it does its job. It's an MPF battery mount, but what I did was over here, there's a connection. This is just a USB connection and you can power this whole monitor with a USB and on my battery here, my V-mount battery has a USB out that powers this with, I think it's about five volts. And on the bottom here, this hot shoe, cold shoe adapter is the Tilta, Tilta model. And I got this with the cage. So this has a Tilta cage. I did a review of the cage. I'll put that review or I'll just put the link to the cage that you could buy. So it came with this piece. That's what that is for. On this side, here's the piece that I didn't use very much. This right here is the Zoom H5. Zoom H5, it can be powered on its own batteries, has two XLRs here, and that's what I would use it for if I was using XLRs or if I wanted redundancy in the audio uh, in a two, two system. And then I can also run an audio cable here and plug it into the audio inside the camera, which is on this side, 3.5 jack. And what I have this rig to is, so this could run on batteries, but the, G, uh, the H5 sucks a lot of juice. So those AA batteries won't last that long if you're using phantom power. What I could have also done is use that V-mount battery, come out with a second USB cable or, or the same one that I'm powering the monitor and then plug it here. It has a different, it takes a different, a standard USB, but I could take the USB, plug it right here and then have the V-mount powering this and any microphone I have on it. The way it's mounted to this rig is that here, the cage that, I have, that I'm rocking right now, the tilt cage came with this handle. This handle also has a place for a 15 mil rod. So I have a, what is that, two, two, three inch rod. I'll undo this. So take that part out. That's just the rod that I have right into the handle. And then on the back of the zoom, I have this, I think it's a Manfrotto or it's just a regular camera mount. So you can screw it with the quarter 20 on the bottom here. And this is what the mount looks like. You can slide this on lights or C stands, but in this case, this perfectly fits a 15 mil rod. And then I could, I fit it in like that. That's how that goes in. Here is my G3 wireless system. I only had one pack cause I didn't really need more than one, was only interviewing one person at a time. Here I have it mounted, uh, it takes its own battery, so it's on double A's right now. It doesn't really take external power, at least not with the G3's. And the way I have it mounted, move these cables here. I have the, it's unplugged now, but here's a 3.5 mil that comes out of here, goes directly into the camera. Unfortunately, with the BGH1, I, I'm not, unless there's an update, I can't control the right and left channels individually. It's only once you plug in the 3.5 that they're both rocking the same. And then this doesn't have output a redundant track where one track could be lower than the other. The way I have this mounted is I screwed on, this piece is meant for gimbals. And this is just a piece right here. It has, I, I got this from Ulanzi. I believe it's meant for gimbals to screw this on a gimbal so you can have extra accessories. But this moves so I have some flexibility. And it also, uh, right here is another hot, uh, cold shoe, but this doesn't actually fit here. So I had to have something like this. This cable right here, I'll do the batteries now. This right here is the cable. Up here is the USB power. And then here is the D-tap. The D-tap is powering my wireless system. And this wireless system is connected via, oh, actually let me, take this off. So it, it takes MPF batteries, Sony MPF batteries. So I have a Sony MPF to DTAP converter and that's what's powering this uh, transmitter right here. And then the transmitter, uh, this is a Hollyland 400S. Uh, it's not the pro version. This one's a few generation, uh, a couple, maybe a, a one or two generations older. I have it connected to the BGH1. One of the benefits of the BGH1 is it has both HDMI, a full HDMI, and it has, uh, well, here's, here's the full HDMI. It has a full HDMI and a SDI out, and you can output both signals at the same time. 
So what I did was this HDMI cable was connected to that monitor that I had up here. And then the B, B, uh, BGH1's HD, uh, SDI port right here, I have a short cable. Unplug this. Take that cable, they're right angle cables, and then right angle to right angle. And that, the, the cool thing about these Holly lens is it has both SDI and HDMI. I have this connected right here with a nano rail adapter. And this cage, this tilt -a cage right here, this rail is a nano compatible. And then this is a mount adapter that's from Small Rig. It's a uh, quarter 20 to uh, NATO. NATO, did I say nano? I meant NATO rail. It's a NATO adapter. And this is meant for monitors, camera monitors that you would just screw on, but I use it for this. This mounting bracket comes with the Hollyland. You could also buy these mounting brackets separately on Hollyland's store. You can get different types of dummy uh, D-tap to the MPF. I, I just got one from Indie Pro. I don't particularly like this one, but this is the one I got. And I have it wrapped around these bongo ties have been quite useful. They're basically like rubber bands that last longer that, that uh, can grip. And I just took all the cabling that was excess, uh, too much of it, I wrapped it around it and I just stuffed it in the middle here. So let me unplug that and also unplug the HDMI cable. So it looks like a spaghetti piece here that, that's wrapped around with the bongo tie. That's all that stuff. Let me remove the battery first. I did a review of this, the FX Lion Nano 2. Love this. One D-tap right here. It also takes just, just you know standard V-mount, which I don't really have a V-mount. Uh, I have V-mount lights, but no V-mount cameras. And over here, there's uh, two outputs of USB and then one input to power the, if you, if you wanna power the, charge the battery and you don't have a D-tap or a, a V-mount charger, you can charge it with, uh, actually, uh, if you have a MacBook, the MacBook's USB-C, you can charge this battery with your MacBook's USB-C charger. And here's a small rig. This is one of their, their small, small. This is small rig's small V-mount plate with uh, the, the rods. I wasn't powering the camera with the V-mount battery. The V-mount battery was powering all of the accessories. I could have also powered this camera because on the side here, it has a DC power over there. And I have an adapter that can go from the D-tap into there and power the camera. But because one of the benefits of the BGH-1 is that they, of these Panasonic batteries, this is the same kind of battery that's in their camcorder line. Like uh, I have here the CX-10 and then there's the CX-350. And you can go back down the line of all of the other Panasonic cameras uh, since they switched over after HDV. They use this battery. You can see the battery indicator here. This lasts the whole shoot. This was this lasts uh, over four hours. This one battery here. So I don't need to power this camera on a detail uh, on a V mount. Just use this battery here. All right, almost breaking everything down. This flap came off. the uh, The flaps to all of these mounts here, uh, or the outputs and inputs. They can be removable. Here's the plastic flap that covered up the audio and headphone jack. It, it just popped out for heavy use. I don't think I broke it. I'm gonna, I could pop it back in there, but you could just remove them so you don't have these dangling there. You know, I'm not gonna shoot at the beach or at the weather, so I don't really need, need these. Um, here's the top handle that's come with Tilta. At the beginning, when I first rigged this out, I, I wasn't a fan of this this handle, but having had a full setup now, this handle is much better than I thought it was gonna be. With the exception of this cold shoe here, doesn't, it's not universal, it doesn't take everything. But man, this, this really, this is a great handle, top handle. The cage is already on here. On this side, if you purchase this cage, it comes with this side grip. This is a tilt -a side grip that adds a little bit of I mean, it adds, imp adds good with the handling, which I didn't really need to handle it. I'll leave this on. And then uh, here is the lens. I did a few shots exterior. A lot of the uh, interviews I was doing was interior, so I didn't need an ND filter. 
As you know, the BGH-1 does not have internal NDs. So what I did was um, I have a variable ND from uh, Freewell. And this Freewell, this is the three to five stop ND. They have one that's more powerful than this, but I don't think I needed the more powerful ND because I'm not shooting in, in harsh, harsh sunlight. And the three to five is five, or not three to five, two to five, sorry. So it's two to five stops of ND is fine. And this one is also coded in a uh, pro mist. So it's not only an ND filter, it's a, it's a pro mist. I think it's a one eighth pro mist or whatever the, the lightest pro mist is. You, you, if you go too heavy with the pro mist, it gets the, the Barbara Walters effect. It looks too the, the, uh, desaturated. Uh, or, or, or two, the highlights are, are too glowy. This is just the right amount of glow and it's magnet front, but you still have to screw it on. The, this is a 77 mil, pretty big lens, 77 mil. This one I got is an 82, so I had to have a step, step up ring. And when, when I put this on, you have, I have to remove the hood because you can't, it's too wide, the one that I bought. So I had to remove the hood and then put the filter on the front when I'm using, when I was shooting outside. And before each shoot, I would have, I would find out, at least I would know if I'm ex, uh, interior or exterior. And I would set this, do this part beforehand. I wouldn't do this on the spot. Not the best solution. I, I do wish that since this is a cinema camera, I, I do wish they had an internal ND wheel that I could toggle through, but this was $2,000 and for, for that price range, you don't see anything like this. At one point, I bought the XLR module that connects to the electronic components in the hot shoe up here. And I wanted to use the XLR module up here, but um, I did another video about this. You basically can't put anything on the camera with the XLR module on. And I think there's a few cages that you can, that it was built around putting the XLR module on, but I, I couldn't keep the XLR module because I couldn't fit it onto all the rigs that I have. And one of the other, uh, it was only a single camera setup, but I did have my GH6 here on uh, ready to go handheld if I ever needed to get some B-roll. Here is also, I could have put an XLR here, but you can see there's there would have been no way to fit the XLR module on on the GH6 either with with the cage systems and it and it's big it's a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be so I was rocking with this here's a 12 to 35 and then this is my black the black mama cage uh, on the small rig so I was going this way and I did end up using this I had to do some b-roll where after we did we did some, uh, did the interviews the sit down interviews then the subject would get up and I would follow them. This has great image stabilization, so I didn't need a gimbal. And the autofocus, mm, that was a problem, but I figured it out if I needed to do a retake. On the BGH-1, the autofocus was a bit of a problem. Since I was filming really fast, I didn't have a you know, first AC and I, I was doing manual focus, but a lot of the times when I'm shooting these sit down interviews, what I like to do is I like the autofocus I like to focus on the eye and then lock, go to manual. The problem with doing that on this lens is that once I went to autofocus, it locked on the person's eye and then I switched to manual. Just by doing this, flipping the switch here, it slightly took the focus off. So there was one interview that I shot where uh, it was soft. Uh, I don't know why I'm laughing at this because it was, uh, and it, it's becoming an issue. And uh, as I was, as we were filming, I realized it was it was off. So then I tweaked it. But that that's a problem. Uh, Panasonic, if they would just fix their autofocus, if they would just make their autofocus better, uh, that would that's the one thing that's really holding these cameras back. Because this is good in low light. This is really good in the BGH one and the GH five S. They're for micro four thirds, amazing in low light. And this is an F 1.7. 
Th this is about as good as, I would say it's about as good as a full frame uh, in low light with, with this setup. It's just the autofocus it is not reliable and it's hard to use. But anyways, that's the breakdown of the camera. Like I said, I'm gonna do another video of the director's monitor um, and I'll put all the components that I just talked about as much as I can find anyways in the description section of this video.